welcome everyone to this Friday's event. This is Life in Perspective, where um, Christian students uh, tell us a little bit about their experience with Christianity uh, and how they became to be Christians. So my first guest tonight is Sam. Sam, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, hello. I'm Sam, as Luke said. I'm 19, second year. I do PPE. I'm from Portsmouth, south coast of England. Um, that's quite a brief synopsis, I suppose. Anything else you'd like to know, Luke? Um, yeah, what was, your, what was your relationship with Christianity like when you were growing up? Yeah, um, I was born into a Christian household. Um, so I always went to church with my family on Sundays, kind of from zero. I can't remember zero, obviously, but from zero, I've been told that I was at church. Um, and yeah, I, my parents never wanted to like force feed it into me. Um, they always said, and they've said now subsequently, I'm older, that they always wanted me to make that decision for myself, um, to be a Christian or not. But yeah, I went to church from before I can remember, really. Um, yeah. Um, so you were you a typical Sunday school kid? Oh, I've got to learn all this incredibly quickly. Or did you, did you have other priorities as most um, kids do? Yeah. I'd love to say I was. <laughs> I would be the moral answer. Unfortunately, being honest, no. Um, certainly cared about other stuff, as most kind of young kids do. I much prefer playing football and playing Xbox with my friends. Um, and yeah, when I was eight, I joined the Sunday League football team. And so that meant that I often had to miss church for football. Um, yeah, I wasn't, I knew it, but I didn't, uh, how can I say? I knew of Jesus, but I didn't know Jesus. You know, I'd, I'd heard the story of Noah's Ark. I'd heard the story about this amazing man who died and came back to life. But, you know, it didn't impact my life. You know. So that's changed now. So what made you take it more seriously? Yeah, um, something quite drastic happened, quite traumatic happened to my family when I was 14. Um, my brother got ran over at 60 miles an hour by a motorbike on the motorway. Yeah, it was... It was quite crazy. Um, he was in a coma for a very long time. He's in intensive care for months. And yeah, yeah, during this period, obviously, it's like an emotional roller coaster. No, there's nothing you can do to kind of prepare yourself for that. Um, and my family was so blessed at that time because my parents went to this church and were stuck into the church. Um, people from the church invited us in. So my brother's in intensive care. Um, so my parents have to be at hospital every night, pretty much. Um, and yeah, people from the church invited us in. I spent like weeks at different people's houses they fed us and I just never felt so loved and it, it shot me why why would anyone feel the need to do this just take some random kid in possibly who I'd never met it might sound a bit weird but my parents trust them so let's <laughs> go along with it um and yeah I'd never felt so loved um and I thought yeah well they've done all this for me I should probably look into this like what is it that about these people who are so happy so able to just bless us um that they know that I don't and so I looked into it. I asked the vicar whose house we were staying at when my parents were at the hospital. And he told me all about Jesus. And he said that, you know, this love that they're displaying to me, think about this kind of love. Jesus loves you infinitely more. Um, and he told me the story of him and it, it blew me away, everything that he's done for me. And I realized that actually this cross, you know, you, you go around about your life. You see that people might have a tattoo of the cross, might wear a cross. And you think, oh, wow, look at them. Cool you know, looking cool. But then I realized then that actually this cross is for me. And it's not just for me, it's literally for everyone. And the vicar told me that it's free. There's nothing that you could have done. You know, I was not the model Sunday school student. <laughs> not that, you know, that was particularly bad. But there was nothing that I could have done or could do to take away this gift for me. It was simply free. And all I had to do was just take it and say, you know what, I know nothing about church. To be honest, I prefer playing football on a Sunday than I do going to church. But regardless, I want to accept this free gift. And yeah, during what was easily the hardest point ever in my life, you know, not actually knowing if my brother's going to wake up and live, seeing my brother, who's my best friend, in a vegetative state, having to relearn everything, being told that he's probably going to die, and to now seeing that he's relearned how to walk, write, talk, and is now thriving. Um, yeah, it would, it would have been silly for me not to try and explore kind of this miracle that God did in my life. How did it, how did it make you feel to sort of 
realized that there was all this stuff for you um for free as you termed it firstly of people in the church who are willing to look after you and then secondly uh god willing to bring you into his family basically for free how did that make you feel it was amazing um you know i'd always thought that the way religion worked was yeah if you're good outweighs your bad then when you die hopefully it'll all be great and you'll kind of enter the into heaven whatever that meant um that was kind of my understanding before but i realized actually it's not like that you know the price has already been paid for me and it's so kind of freeing that i know that no matter what i do because this guy incredible man called jesus died and came back to life he paid the price he paid the wage of my sin then um and it's, it's just the most freeing feeling ever and since then, my life's been infinitely better. And I know that's not, you know, testimony for why Jesus is real. My life's been better since. But for me, yeah, it, it's one reason why I could say that I truly do believe. And in, like, what practical ways did you see your life changing after uh, you came to this realisation? Yeah, everything, my habits, my mood, my thinking. Um, I started to read the Bible, the vicar who took us in while my parents were at the hostel would do that with us every night um and when you know when someone's life's on the line i'd never like felt myself actually like crying out to god i was just like god if you're there please heal heal my brother um and I, I i felt him knocking on my heart then there and then um and kind of on a practical level now every day i try and pray as much as i can um amidst the hubbub of life um you know i read my bible and that kind of teaches me and shows me ways I should try and live and through living that way my life's been a lot better since then than it was before um yeah so you've you've come to this realization that there's this this amazing thing for you what advice would you give someone who's maybe flirting with the idea or is looking for something big yeah I mean what I'd say especially because most of my friends aren't Christians. So I probably know something of how you feel. Obviously everyone has their own individual story. But what I'd say is this question, if true, does quite literally change everything. Um, you know, it's not, just, it's not just some question about whether coronavirus is going away, going to go away, sorry. This question does change everything. And if it's true, then it's the most important thing anyone has ever heard. And if not, then I'm literally the same as this peg, really. I'm just a thing. This peg is a thing. But if it is true, then there's a creator, there's someone who made me, and there's this man who died, came back to life, paid the price for everything that I've done in my life. Um, and that means that when I die, God will see that I believed in him. That's all I have to do. All I have to say is I believe in you. I don't, you know, I, I don't know everything about you. I mess up. I get things wrong, but I believe in you. And when, then when I die, God will then accept me and have eternal life with him. Um, and yeah, I just really encourage you. It may seem weird. It may seem strange. Church may seem quite boring, to be honest, but just give it a go, you know, because what have you got to lose? Ultimately, if it's true, I can guarantee it will change your life for the better. And if it's not true, well, I believe it's true, but, but if it isn't true, then it's not going to do any harm from trying to look into what we're doing here. Um, because as I say, it's the most important thing ever. If you are watching and you want um, some information about how to look into this, um, please message the Facebook page of Warwick Christian Union or fill out the feedback form in the description um, and we'll love to get in contact with you. Thanks uh, so much for joining me, Sam. I'll be back in a second with another student.
back. I'm here with another student, uh, Jack. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, hello, I'm Jack. Um, I'm a third year student and I study global sustainable development. So, uh, a wild shot in the dark, I'm guessing you're a Christian. Um, yes. Did you uh, grow up with Christian parents? Um, I did indeed. In fact, my parents, I grew up in Albania for the first four or five years of my life. Um, my parents were missionaries out there, which essentially just means they work for the church out there because Albania has a interesting history and there was some church work to do um, when I was very young. So, yeah. So, so from a, like a very early age, you were hearing about God and hearing about the Bible and stuff like that. Yeah, super young. Um, like I said, when you grow up in a literally church building environment, then yeah, you do hear quite a bit. Um, went to church, you know, all the time as a kid. I do remember going to church more or less every Sunday, um, right the way through the very youngest years of my life. So yeah, I heard about God all my life, all 20 years. Fair. So when you sort of thought about it, what was your, um, your sort of opinion or your experience of the whole Christianity thing? Um, in primary school, I was strangely zealous about it, which, you know, I was quite passionate. Um, although I didn't know us, of course. Um, I think it was just more like an identity thing, like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm Christian. Um, I remember in year six, one parents' evening, my teacher said to my parents that I was like the class prophet. Because I think I had like one RS lesson, and, um, and I apparently spoke a lot about it all. So I think I was really interested as a kid um, in the whole religion thing. And that definitely stretched into secondary school. Um, I was very, very interested in apologetics, um, which is kind of like the study of arguments around theology and religion. So the very intellectual side of it. Um, I was really interested in that, but um, much less so in actually what Christianity is about. And um, rather than proving it through various philosophical and scientific arguments, um, I kind of, yeah, I seem to ignore the lifestyle requirements of it um, instead. But I've always really appreciated the value of religion in society and in how our world has developed. Um, and that's something that's probably continued throughout my various academic endeavours, including college and then university and stuff. So always, obviously, yeah, always identified as a Christian. So God to me was a good and interesting thing. I was never negative um, or... Never been, yeah, yeah, I've never been negative about it. Mm. And so you started off quite zealous, do you think, or zealous is a bit of a weird word, so you started off quite keen. Do you think you sort of kept that keenness on the level or it increased or it, it declined or what do you think? Um, well, uh, <laughs> this is the T. Um, so... Going through secondary school, yes, primary school, fine, just like any primary school kid, you don't actually know anything, obviously. Secondary school, you still don't actually know anything. Um, however, um, in secondary school, I stopped going to church because um, I joined cadets and I just, all my weekends were full, cadets was a huge part of my life. And um, the few weekends that I didn't have cadet -y things to do, um, I didn't want to spend them in church, I didn't like my church, I didn't like my youth group. Um, wasn't that interested in actually having to go and hear a sermon. Um, even though I was quite interested in, especially in like year nine, year 10, I would get quite into, like I said, the intellectual stuff, um, philosophy about like the universe, creation, etc. cetera. Um, but I didn't actually want to hear about what the Bible said. <laughs> um, and so in that sense, my, to use the weird word, the zeal or keenness, um, definitely started to dip off towards the latter end of secondary school. I think because, obviously, I'd grown up 13 years, 14 years of my life at that point, um, being a Christian through identity and through just what was surrounding me, um, there was always that, always that core to my kind of lifestyle, as it were. However, um, my actual outward interest definitely dipped, and especially moving into college. So I'd say end of secondary school... Um, Maybe a little shaky, um, but, you know, I wasn't swaying absurdly far off the mark in terms of a quote-unquote Christian lifestyle, might assume. Um, you know, each year I'd, from about the age of 13, I'd go to these 
kind of Christian conferences that are once a year that loads of people go to all around the country. And I go with my family because well, my parents made me go, but I enjoyed them. And so, yeah, there's always like a background faith thing, but my foreground, my kind of social activity and outlook was not, they weren't quite aligned. They weren't the same thing. And so um, moving into college, though, they got even more and more disaligned. And um, yeah, if you didn't already know I was a Christian, um, then you probably wouldn't have guessed that I was a Christian either. Um, so yeah, there's definitely been that change in my perspective and interest or keenness for my faith. Um, in fact, my faith became, to me, it was quite inconvenient um, during uh, college. Um, so I'm from Cornwall, just a bit of context. Um, there's like one big main college in Cornwall. There are a couple, but there's no sixth forms, more or less. And so my college was like 5,000 students. It's a very social two years and there's a lot going on just in terms of people start drinking around the age and stuff. And so um, that seemed way more interesting than my faith might have been to me. So yeah, that's kind of how my keenness has gone. Uh, so with college, do you felt like you were, you were being consistent? So you say your keenness sort of faded. Did it sort of stay at a a low level throughout those two years, or were you going through through patterns of like you'd have you'd have good months and bad months, if you know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a very apt description. So I found in college. So I guess long story short, well, they're not too short. Um, yeah, in college, I definitely did succumb. I would say to yeah, we'll just swap what 16, 17, 18 year olds got up to. Um, it was lots of drinking, smoking, parties, game with people, whatever, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I would, again, I kind of just always had this background kind of like ticking of, of my faith and it can, that caused me to fluctuate a lot. So I would try to justify my typical, you know, the typical 16, 17 year old lifestyle. Um, through ignoring parts of the Bible that maybe weren't so convenient and twisting other bits that, again, I say, well, it doesn't really matter. That, you know, I can I can still get really drunk because technically, blah blah blah. Um, all wrong, by the way. But um, and similar, just every other kind of aspect of, um, yeah, that kind of living. Um, I try to justify it in some way, and. But then I would go to these Christian conferences in the summer and it was kind of like almost having two identities in a way where in some ways I would say, yeah, I'm a Christian. You know, I do believe in this stuff, but I don't believe in it firmly enough to live it out, um, which is due to a number of reasons. Not as fun. Friends don't believe in it. Don't go to church. I don't fully understand what it requires. I think and that that's the main one. You know, it's that I because I haven't gone to church since the age of 13, and at this point I'm 16, 17, so it's been like four years. Um, I just didn't understand fully enough what it meant to be a Christian. Um, I thought I knew, and I would probably be quite prideful and say, hey, I know I'm, I'm actually a Christian. I kind of know what it's all about, and I've still got my life sorted out. Even though I'm just a 17-year-old kid, I know nothing. Um, and so I took the convenient parts of Christianity. I, oh yeah, I'm saved. Um, I get to go to heaven. Um, you know, I can try and be a nice person, cool. Um, etc etc but in terms of having any discipline over my life and turning away from my own desires and self-gratification and all of that side of the faith um nah for me that wasn't as interesting and so so we'll just go get super drunk super high get with whoever um all those kind of just things that characterize 17 year old mm. person going through college because that's just like i said that was like the college atmosphere that i was very in and so um yeah so yeah. it seems you kind of have almost two kind of conflicting identities if you will you have the the christian one on one hand and then you have the the let's call it the typical 17 year old one on the other hand uh, and they don't sort of work together so you kind of had to pick one why did you go for the christian one rather than the typical one mm. um, well um, I would just say that the other one as much as it might bring me instantaneous joy you know people like me get to whatever I want 
Um, and then the instant one. Those things. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a typical side of things. Like that sure would bring me momentary kind of contentness, but um, I had this constant internal conflict because I'd grown up with that kind of Christian foundation in my life. I was aware deep down that what I was doing was wrong. Um, whether or not I wanted to acknowledge that and whether or not I wanted to, you know, change my ways when I was 16, 17, I was like, I don't, I can just think about that when I'm older. I want to have fun now. But um, that progressively became more and more pressing um, in me. And so I'd have these, you know, spiritual highs over the summer when I'd go to a Christian conference um, and I'd think, oh, actually, yeah, this is what I believe in. You know, I really regret doing what I've done over my first year of college, for example. Um, you know, I want to change that. But then two months later, I'll be back in college. And, you know, I've kind of forgotten that. The, the feeling's gone. I'm um, still Christian, sure, but, um, you know, just not my focus. And so, and there's just this constant conflict because I knew what I was doing was wrong. Um, I knew that it wasn't what, yeah, it wasn't what I'd kind of like expected of my life either. Because growing up in a Christian home, I didn't ever see myself kind of moving down to this. And um, it kind of culminated towards the end of college where, I just felt that inner conflict the whole time. That's a lot, really, for a 17... At the, end of, at the end of college, you know, I'm 17 years old. That's a lot for a 17-year-old to be thinking through, um, having such a ethical, moral, philosophical dilemma in, right, which path am I going to take? And it did get a lot. And, um, you know, it was hard for me to navigate it. And I'd, there's a lot of guilt involved. And, you know, when you've done X, Y, and Z that you know is wrong it's really hard then to ask for forgiveness because that's a huge part of the Christian faith. It's hard to then turn to God and say, like, you know, why, why do you accept me? Um, I've even known you kind of, and I still chose these things instead of these last few years. Um, who am I to draw near and possibly ask for forgiveness? And so um, that conflict became really big. And towards the end of my second year of college here, yeah, um, it just kind of all switched. And... Um, all of a, like I say all of a sudden, um, I had like a very brief relationship towards the end of college and I dipped out of it quickly because just that conflict amounted a lot. Um, and it was after that where I kind of just had that reflection and thought, right, you know, either I can persist in this way. And I just, I, just, I knew, I just knew deep down that that was not going to satisfy, that was not going to make me content in any way, shape or form for the rest of my life. Um, and I was like, right, well, I've had a taste of this other truth the truth um of the christian faith and i know what that holds and i just came back to god and um it was kind of like a, i choose you instead and i just didn't want to i just didn't want to do the other stuff anymore um it was like that guilt and conflict i got to a point where i was like i don't i just don't even want to have this riding up inside of me and so yeah, I just kind of turned back to God, started reading my Bible a bit more, praying a bit more, wanted to go to church again. You know, I could drive now that I was 17. Um, I could go to a, church, to a church that I actually liked. Um, and yeah, so that was quite a big reason for my switch. It just all built up and I felt that conviction to turn back to God, as it were. Mm. So just as a final little thing, if there was someone perhaps listening uh, who was perhaps teetering between these two things between a christian personality let's say and a typical personality what what advice would you give them mm. um very good question fluctuating between the two it just tears you up so much um one analogy that i've heard before is like, say you have a fire that's made up of a lot of really hot coals. And um, you know, when they're all on fire together, they keep hot. They keep each other hot. When you take one out and put it on its own in the cold, that, that one coal will go, it'll go out. Um, whereas all the others will stay hot together. And that's kind of like a representation of maybe me and maybe like other people in the same situation of when they are maybe at their spiritual highs, sure, it's really easy to feel hot and on it. But then the moment you're on your own and you move yourself away from that, you will get cold and you will flicker out and you will never quite get it. Um, it will just tear you up. And um, and obviously you will never find contentness from it. I think that's just something I noticed um, quite profoundly was that, you know, nothing else is going to satisfy. And also in terms of the Bible, you know, 
like looking at what the word says. Say you ask someone who battles with it and like kind of feels like they believe but they don't want to give up their lives. Um, a big thing in the Bible is, as Jesus would say, die, you know, die to yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Um, and that's so countercultural. That is the complete opposite of what we're taught in society. In society, it's gratify your own desires, you know, be the best you, you're amazing, um, you can do whatever you want, don't let anyone else tell you what to do. And, um, and I mean, I kind of tried that and it worked out horribly. And I feel it actually works out much more horribly than people would like to admit, but because that's what we get force fed, um, people don't want to, yeah, people would rather, they, they think that, that that's, that's surely the answer. And it's not, um, you know, it says in the Bible as well, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And true words, you would struggle to find. Um, I felt I could so see myself walking in the darkness. Um, and then when you step into the light, it's like, it just makes sense. And I find that value. I didn't, I'm not living for myself anymore. Um, it's, I don't have to worry about, pleasing others. I don't have to worry about my own success. I don't have to worry about my own failures either. Because even though I came from s such a spot where a lot of people would say, oh no, I've done too much wrong now to be able to become a Christian. Um, and maybe that's why a lot of people are on the fence of feeling. They're like, well, you know, I've kind of done it now. Um, the Bible says the exact opposite. Um, you know, it says, blessed is he who takes refuge in the Lord. Um, you, there's nothing you can ever do that will take you too far from Christ that he was not going to forgive you and that's something that I just that really hit me profoundly was even though I've done all these things for the last since I was in it 14 15 16 17 slightly 18 um despite all of that I could come back to God and he would welcome me with loving arms um there's a story in the bible um it's called the story of the prodigal son and I always thought I've always really resonated with this story because it's very exemplar of my own life and it's just a story about very, very briefly, about um, a son and his, he asked for his father's inheritance early, which back then was even more rude than it would sound now. It's like saying, dad, I wish you were dead now so that I could take your inheritance. Um, dad, for some reason, gave him his inheritance. This kid who knew his father um, went off, spent it all in modern day terms. It's like he went to you know Las Vegas and just spent it all on poker and strippers or whatever. And um, then he had nothing. Then he was down in a pit, no money on the streets. And, um, and he thought, right, I've got nothing. Maybe if I go back to my father, maybe he'll let me work on his farm. Uh, maybe he'll let me be a servant. Servants were obviously very common back then. He was like, I've just got no other choice. I'm going to die if I don't turn back to some form of owning an income through my father's land. And even though he had sinned, even though he had told his father basically to die, um, he then came back and it says in the Bible how the father sees his son coming from afar and his father just runs to him, arms wide open and embraces his son. And then he's holding his son. He brings him back into the house screaming, look, my son has returned. He's back. And that's just so, such a beautiful imagery for what it's like when you've maybe turned away from God. Maybe you've done wrong. Maybe you've been sitting on the fence. Maybe you've been sinning when you know you shouldn't have been, but the father will always have his arms wide open. And, you know, someone like me, who I could list off for years, all the wrong that I've done, if you can still accept me. And now I've found so much joy and peace and contentness in knowing him and in living for him and not living for myself and following what the, what the Bible says on how to lead your life um, in, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all these things that the Bible talks about. Um, it's so much more fulfilling and then you, you, you this in the conflict stops you know I think we talk about you know are you Christian or not are, they, are you religious as if it's some trivial matter as if it's just some slight lifestyle change it's not just a slight lifestyle lifestyle change or deviation it is a profoundly important eternally impactful decision um, to f either well follow Christ or not and it affects, yeah, again, it's not just lifestyle, it affects every facet of your being. And then ultimately also you can get on to the conversation of heaven or hell. And that is very important. And do you want to roll the dice and risk losing all of that for the sake of momentary gratification? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so just turn to the Bible, turn to God, um, read it, pray, and you will find forgiveness freely offered. <laughs>
Thanks uh, so much for joining us, Jack. And um, we'll be back with another student very shortly. Welcome back, everyone. I'm here with my next student. This is Cheyenne. Cheyenne, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, so I am a third year PACE student, um, part of the CU, and I used to do triathlon, but didn't join this year because of COVID, <laughs> sadly. And um, Cheyenne, I'm, I'm guessing you're a Christian. You're a member of the Christian Union. It would be weird if you weren't a Christian. <laughs> How long <laughs> would you say... Uh, you have been a Christian? Um, about three years, um, going up from the 28th of July, 2017. Specific. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about when and where that happened? Um, so I was at a youth camp in Nottingham for a week and I kind of went with the attitude of, oh, this is so stupid. Why am I even here? Gosh, like, and I had just had such a snack attitude. Um, and I remember getting, like, feeling like, oh, I've taken away nothing from this whole week. And then getting to the end of the week on the Friday. Um, and it was just kind of a thing where, like, I had the love of God explained to me. Like, the sermon that they did was the love of Jesus, like, and explaining how God loves us. And like in my life before that, for a bit of context, I was really, really from past kind of bad experiences, I was really struggling to kind of perceive and accept love from people around me. So that could be like platonic stuff, like that could be um, romantic, that could be my family. I just really didn't feel like anyone loved me. And I thought not only am I unloved, but I am unlovable. So there is no like love to be perceived in the like foreseeable future. And I was just really pessimistic. Um, and I just remember having this explained to me and for the first time ever feeling such a sense of peace um, that I'd never felt before. And I just was like, wow, this is amazing. Um, and I, I think as well, because I saw the people around me and I was like, they have something that I don't have. And I was like, and it was the first time ever that I'd actually like spoken to God and said, what do they have that I don't have? And why can't I have it kind of thing? And I was, I was, I was almost angry, um, but I just remember um, just actually praying and saying you know god i'm actually ready you know i've i've been my friends have been telling me about this stuff and i've had a bit of an attitude about it but i think i'm actually ready to give up and actually um, allow you to work in my heart and that was when the kind of sense of peace just dropped and it went from like head knowledge to like heart knowledge like yes this is true like i'm actually experiencing all the things that they were talking about so you you say this all came from one talk one sermon where they explain this stuff to you what did they actually say that was so profound so um just for a bit of context as well like i grew up in a home where my mother was a christian and she took us to church but i was very much like 
oh my gosh, why are you taking us to church? Like dragging us there. Like, and I, if honestly, I don't think I could actually consider myself a Christian because I didn't really believe in the existence of God. Um, but she, I'd always heard certain things. Like she'd always say little things like, oh, all liars go to hell and things like this. And I used to get so scared. Like, oh my gosh, this, this God guy sounds like terrifying. If he's real, like I was like, this is terrifying to me. He sounds a bit like a like authoritarian <laughs> figure. Like he doesn't sound very friendly or nice. Um, and then they explained to me grace, um, the grace of God that is expressed through Jesus, like and what Jesus has done. And the idea that actually I don't need to have everything perfect or right because Jesus has already done that for me. However, explaining it in a way that grace is not just there so that you can continue doing exactly what you want to do, but it's it almost spurs you on because you're like, wow, like God loves me that much that he did that for me. And it almost, like what I can describe it as is it, it makes you want to be better. It makes you want to be better out of love for God um, in the way that he loves you. Um, so that explanation of grace, like I just kind of, I kind of put grace as synonymous with love because like I'd realized like it just, it was just a different form of love that I'd never actually heard of or come across before. And it was just so profound to me. Mm. Yeah, so can you tell us a little bit more about sort of this thing you, that you're calling grace and the other thing that you're calling works and what's the difference between them and why God does what he does? That's kind of a massive question, but if you can yeah. give us a little insight into it, it'd be great. Yeah, so um, with grace, um, I've I've come to learn that before I was I, the way I saw God was that I thought that he operated by works and works is just you thinking I can be a good person and good my way into heaven I can do good things I can just kind of balance it out or or maybe you might just think I have to do all good things to get into heaven and things like that and to an extent fair enough like if you were to follow if you were to be perfect and to follow everything yeah you could make it but nobody is and everybody like even subconsciously we do things that are wrong and things that displease god um the only person that was ever perfect was jesus christ and <laughs> you saw what happened with him um but then in what jesus did like you find grace so grace has been extended to us and that is that our sins of the past um our sins of as of current and our sins in the future god has known them all and has sent his son um, to die in our place and to cover all of the sins of humanity if we believe in him and if we trust in the fact that he's done that for us um, and that's really great because grace doesn't even just it's not even just about oh I forgive you for all the bad things you're doing and that you're going to keep doing no it's I'm not only forgiving you but I'm freeing you it's like a liberating experience you're being freed from kind of the grasp of your desire and like of your sin and it's it's kind of giving you that freedom to be able to to be who god wants you to be basically um so it's a really liberating experience so in sort of a day-to-day -day way how did that change what you were thinking and what you were feeling about about god and about the people around you um it definitely i think one thing that it just made <laughs> well one big difference that was made um was that I could now, well, I was able to go home and like from that um, camp and I was able to kind of perceive the love of others around me. Like before that, I was just like, I'm so unlovable. I'm like, that's just not, that's just how I am. That's just how things are always going to be. Um, and then I realized like that people do love me around me. And like, I was able to perceive that. And I was also able to give out love as well. And also to experience the love of God. Um, and it just brought, my well it brought me so much closer to everybody else in my life like um recently during lockdown my whole family became christian it was amazing and like the way that we've become close in the like past few years since i've become a christian has just been unlike anything else like i'm able to see god's original design for community for fellowship for relationship um not only with him but with other people he doesn't just want to kind of glue us to him and like keep us away from the world it's not just a me and god thing but it's a me and you and god thing um which is just really beautiful mm. so if there was if there are people struggling with sort of love and interacting with people and thinking that they're they're unlovable as you said what would you say to someone like that 
I just say, <laughs> give God a try. I like actually seek God. I mean, for me, when I was when I was in this situation, um, all those years ago, I wasn't searching for God. I was just kind of sat there, feeling sorry for myself, just there. Like, and one thing I realized, like, it was it was actually like other believers that had reached out to me. I would say don't wait for other believers to reach out to you of course if you're watching this like this is this is your green signal to get to search like and to look into the bible um there's a scripture that i read when i actually did start reading the bible that was um you will find me when you seek me with your whole heart and that was just something for me where i was like right i'm gonna go for it i'm gonna go after it and in that first year of me becoming a christian i was really really like intentional to meet with other believers and go through the scriptures and it gave me such a bigger or well, a greater understanding of god and as you get to know god more you get to understand his character and you get to understand just how amazing what he does is and and just how amazing the way he loves is um and then you also get to embody that and be like that and it's just it's amazing it's amazing mm. thanks so much for joining us Cheyenne. um if you're watching and your interest has been sparked by anything you've heard um there are two main things that you can do the first one is if you want to hear more stories like this, get in touch with the CU. Feed out, fill out the feedback form in the description below, um, or it could be above, I'm, depending on what you're watching on. Um, fill that out, and we can get in contact, and we can hook you up to meet up with someone. But the second one is, if you want to experience stuff like this, then the best thing you can do is to work out who God is by reading the Bible. If you're kind of, that seems kind of scary to you and you want someone to help you through it, get in touch and we can hook you up with someone. But the best thing you can do to get to know God and to experience all these things that we've been talking about, this peace and this love, just read the Bible. Thanks so much for watching everyone. <laughs>